Today I'm going to talk to you um, a little bit about <clears throat> these three topics. Okay, I think that you probably know this one fairly well. Red flags we can we can talk about forever. The communication. I want to talk a little bit about what do you do when you find red flags, and then also how do you refer to treatment and um, and get somebody help that they might need if they're struggling with an opioid use disorder. So I have the, the pleasure of working with Rob Pack, who I think you talked with or heard talk. Yes? Yes. Okay. So I work with Rob a lot. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about some of the, the epidemiology and how big of a problem prescription drug abuse is, um, things like that. We're just going to get right into it. So, <clears throat> so these, are, these are my objectives. What I what I was told I needed to talk to you about. So this is what I, I hope that I can, hope what I can do. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the factors that inform your identification of these three things. We'll talk about what those three things actually are here in just a minute. Describe, the, a lot of the research that we do is about prescriber uh, communication, pharmacist communication, and then communication interprofessionally between the two professions. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk a little bit about some opioid risk assessments and screening tools. Um, make sure y'all know the what the differences are in those. Um, talk about ways that you can refer to treatment. And then we can talk a little bit about um, team-based care was mentioned. I think that's kind of going to be integrated throughout the whole talk. <clears throat> so we talk a lot about identifying it. Um, we, we see this a lot in our research. You might have red flags that you, you've identified or something about a patient just kind of gives you the heebie-jeebies. You think maybe something's not, um, something's going on that you don't know about or that they're hiding. What are, so what are some factors that you've seen in your practice that what you would consider to be red flags? Allergic to everything except for Percocet. Allergic to everything except for Percocet. Except for Percocet. Okay. It starts with a D. <clears throat> okay. After a, if they're on, if they're prescribed um, opioids, they, if they fall, they use a significant more amount without talking to anybody about it. So they just like self prescribe or self treat pain if they have any issues. Okay. If one is good, then like four is going to be exactly. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Time. Yeah. Okay. Other things? Asking for refills early. Yep. Really common. History of other poly substance abuse or other substance abuse. Yep. Uh, we could go on and on and on, right? So the I don't I don't think we really necessarily have an issue of identifying it, whatever it is that may be bugging us about a patient or about a situation. But it's the it's kind of the dog chasing the car analogy. And every once in a while a dog will actually catch one, right? Then what do you do with it? Right, what do you do with it once you catch somebody or how do you help somebody that may have an opioid use disorder <clears throat> or not just that but um, maybe something else. So what's abuse? How would you define abuse? Prescription drug abuse. We hear that a lot. What does that mean? Not taking as directed. Not, that's the simplest, yes. So it could be um, overuse, which you mentioned, um, be for a use that's not um, an intended use or for the feeling it causes. Right? Those are the, the three big things. But it, all those things boil down to not taking it as prescribed. Right? What about diversion? What's diversion? So, say it again. Okay. Selling. Selling it, right? Yep. So for a lot of people, this is a, is it isn't necessarily a, it's it's a source of income, right? So it's something that needs to be considered for sure. So <clears throat> you can have both, right? Somebody could be abusing. They could also be diverting. It could be going to someone else. And then you have opioid use disorder, which is what? Yeah, it's a DSM-5, it's a diagnosis, right? And then you've got the spectrum of opioid use disorder 
so what we would what we would uh, used to call addiction, this has kind of replaced that. Okay. And again, you can be somewhere along that, just to, to clarify those terms. <clears throat> I may call it addiction. It's really hard to not call it addiction and, and call it opioid use disorder, but um, bear with me if I do. All right, so here's a scenario. Okay, thoughts about that? Is this, a, is this like a left field case or is it fairly, okay. <clears throat> we took it, this is some, some research we've done <clears throat> with, uh, with, this was with uh, Tennessee primary care prescribers pr and, and physicians specifically, okay. So this case, and we took quite a bit of time to try to develop these cases in a way that were patients you would typically see or a way that a patient would, would present. So. And when we asked physicians across the state, and this is an end of about 350 was our response right here. <clears throat> Given 10 such patients, how many times, zero out of 10, for how many of those patients would you conduct a risk assessment to look at, you know, they may not have a current opioid use disorder, but are they, based on some of their um, history, where they have a history of, of abusing something else, or they have some other, um, they have some mental health conditions, things of that sort, they can be setting themselves up to struggle with an opioid use disorder even though they've never had one in the past, okay? So about one and a half out of 10 patients, we would do that. So, um, you know, thoughts about that? What's the, what are the barriers there, do you think? <coughs> Time knowledge, I agree completely. It's no different for pharmacists. We're so I, I really think you should do a med medical evaluation first and see why they're having more of an industry. Yeah. It's not just a slam dunk, this is an opioid use disorder. This That's right. Uh, so you're not doing your job unless you look at that way too. Right, so. Then you can add in the assessment as part of that. Yeah, 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 ab absolutely. There's more medical evaluation that needs to be done. But I would say that in the process of doing that, something you need to probably consider is are they at risk for an opioid use disorder or for abusing this based on some, some past history? And it's pretty easy to do. We'll talk a little bit about I'll, I'll just clarify at the beginning. You won't find a perfect assessment. You won't find a perfect questionnaire. And I don't want to introduce you to a questionnaire that's going to make decisions for you. I want to give you some questionnaires that you can use to drive conversations with your patients, which I think that's the way you ought to consider the Control of Substance Monitor Database is not a decision making tool. It's a tool to help you make a decision. Okay, same with these um, little assessments. Okay, so our red flags, currently we tend to focus on identification. You can find all kinds of things online about identifying red flags. <clears throat> and what we tend to do there is we tend to use those red flags as either we prescribe or dispense or we don't pr prescribe or dispense. Okay. And we've asked lots of prescribers, lots of pharmacists, on this zero to 10 scale, you'll see that they tend to be on one. They're either gonna do it all the time or they're not gonna do it at all. Okay, so this, the defaults that you set are gonna drive your, your behavior overall, which makes sense. There's a little emphasis on resolution. <clears throat> Here's an example just to give you the perspective of, of pharmacists. So we, this, is a, this was a big survey of community pharmacists in Tennessee. So about 90% say yes, prescription drug abuse is a problem in my practice setting, which is not, I mean, I think that's, makes sense, okay? This was probably the most interesting one. Of the prescriptions, of all the opioid pain reliever prescriptions that they dispensed, they perceived 53% to be legitimate. And if you know about corresponding responsibility, 
for a pharmacist, it really ought to be 100% are legit, or they probably shouldn't be going out the door, right? So they were estimating that around 53% were legit, and then they were just a tad over 10% that had addiction treatment facility information in their offices. So do you have information here that you can give, this, give the people? We would have to print it out. Okay. I encourage you to have that available and, and, and accessible to your, to your patients. So our identity, our identity, our legitimacy judgments legit. And I think that what you're going to find is if you're going to evaluate the legitimacy of something, you have to communicate about that. And, and that's what I want to talk, talk to you a little bit about today. <clears throat> so the communication landscape. We started out when we were doing our research and we, when we submitted this NIH proposal, this is what we had. <coughs> well, this is where we want to focus. There's communication that happens in this triad, and we want to make sure that this is optimal, patient-centered, piece of cake, right? And then you start adding in all of the other things that go on. Um, some of it's communication with a person, some of it's communication with a system. It gets to be a hot mess, right? I'm not telling you anything that you don't know. But when you try to figure out where do you intervene in there, um, we've just kind of taken the, the concept, you've got to start somewhere, right? So we're, we're going to start, and we're going to start, try focusing on those big arrows, and, but we'll, I'll, I'll let you know how some of these other folks and these systems impact this triangle. Sometimes it's not in a good way. <clears throat> so what, what we found through our research, and so was Dr. Tudover here, or was he at? In the department. Yeah, he was in the department. Where did he practice? I don't remember. He, he precepted okay. all three sites. Okay. So he was, he was really instrumental in, in this study. So he, uh, he and I were, were tag-teaming this. But what we found was that it <clears throat> doesn't matter if it is a, a physician, a pharmacist, we tend to make up stuff, okay? And if we don't lie, if something makes us uncomfortable, then we'll make up a policy so, to make it easier, right? The, the time that I saw this that was the most impactful was, and so you, some, anybody did med school here, you would do the communication skills course, and you'd do the interprofessional course, and you'd have standardized patients that you'd counsel, or you'd interview, right? And so I had the students individually I had two medicine and one pharmacy, and we had a patient that was coming in to get in. Uh, the, the prescriber had retired. They were coming to get a new prescription from a new prescriber, and they needed to refill on their controlled substance. And three for three, without seeing the others, they said, oh, we don't prescribe controlled substances in this clinic. And that was not in the script. Okay. So they just made that up <laughs> on, on the spot. <laughs> They did, they, they, and, and three for three. And then it was funny because the other two sat in the room as they went, and so the third person, they were like, he did it too. It's just, it was amazing that that, that was the, the go-to conversation, right? So, we, but we're good at this. So pharmacists will say, we don't dispense for out-of-state patients. Tell me if I'm wrong. All right, what are some other things that you see in the pharmacy setting? What are some other policies we'll... Yeah, yeah, we don't have it, right? We don't have it. And I can, I'll ask pharmacy students, is it okay to lie to patients? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay, and then you give them a scenario, like what are you going to do if someone shows up to your pharmacy and they want to purchase Sudafed, but you think they're making meth? I'm going to tell them I don't have it. Okay, well, that's lying. Oh, that's different, okay? It's not, it's not really different, but so we've, we just, we naturally go here, right? And then we also use confrontational language. We've got great quotes of confrontational language from prescribers and pharmacists both that they don't think it's confrontational. But if, uh, they'll, they'll say, uh, so you give them a, a patient scenario, what do you, what's the approach you would take? So if somebody's coming in, ask them for a, uh, an early refill. What are you gonna ask them? Well, I'm not gonna say anything controversial, but I'm just gonna ask them, why aren't you taking this the way you're supposed to be taking it? <laughs> okay, that's pretty confrontational. 
So th there's a lot of just default language that we use that's probably not setting ourselves up to be real rapport building. So, so what, what we've tried to do is figure out how can you change some of this stuff? Because if you just go with the default, you're often going to um, not be engaging in patient-centered communication. And the only way I know how to improve it is to practice it. So, One of the other things we do is we avoid tough conversations. We do it sort of through this, but we also do it through patients. So we do a lot of indirect communicating. And I know I did this when I was in uh, the pharmacy setting. <clears throat> if I had an issue with a prescription, I would say, you need to take this back to your doctor and tell them they need to fix this. I could have called, right? But I didn't. I communicated indirectly through the patient back to the physician. Right? So you can probably think about your practices and how you might do that sometimes where you put a little bit more responsibility on the patient to have a conversation where you might be able to have one yourself and, and take the middleman out of it. So we're, we're good at that. So here's some quotes from pharmacists and physicians just to give you a feel for what we've seen. This was a really interesting focus group. It was a focus group of just physicians. And I think it was a practice changing focus group, which the focus group wasn't supposed to be an intervention in and of itself. <laughs> but what came out of this was that um, we need to have some resources available to direct patients to, uh, as opposed to discharging. So, um, I, d I didn't follow up to see what they did, but it was just a kind of a consensus. So like, holy smokes, we should probably be doing this, but we're not. So really encourage you to do that. <clears throat> this is the patient perspective. It's a little, they're not cleaned up, so um, I'll let you read through there. So this one's pharmacy specific, but I think you can probably think of a patient or two or 20, right, where you, you, you kind of just like makes your stomach hurt a little bit to think about them coming in. And, and it's, um, there's a lot of stigma, and we found that there's a lot of stigma in the health profession just like there is in um, the general public as well. Okay, here's another case for you to read through. Mm -hmm. Okay, thoughts about this case? So in this case, we are not the prescriber of any of the controlled substances. Um, we are also a prescriber, and they're getting it from all sources. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So this is what we found. <clears throat> Whatever you do with the patient, this is something that you might want to consider, right? And, and this, well, but discharging was fairly common, right? And it goes back to that comment. It's probably the easiest thing to do in that situation. But um, the, it was interesting. We were presenting at the, I don't know if any of y'all were there, at the, there was a Save a Life conference that was at the Millennium Center. Were any of you there? 
one of the so it was it was more about naloxone <clears throat> but it was really interesting to, to hear a lot of the providers talk about heroin and this um, heroin just made people mad a lot of the prescribers mad they felt betrayed and they didn't want to deal with it they, so they discharged and I would just um, I, I caution you that you may be a last point of contact for someone and heroin is here All right so I just really don't don't get mad if someone's on heroin you can get mad but don't don't send them out or abandon them because you may be the last link to health care and they're a lot easier to get through you than than from the street so um, heroin is a big deal at over mountain recovery um, almost every patient it's 90 something percent if not a hundred percent um, has used heroin so it's not just prescription opioids because that supply is getting pr really restricted at this point so um, Heroin is here, so. Are we seeing at least with fentanyl too? <clears throat> um, I can't honestly can't tell you for sure. I don't know that they've they've analyzed it here. I know that there is some awareness of fentanyl among that population. We haven't at Over seen Mountain. a big published spike in deaths. Right. Yeah. Right. I think it's just a matter of time. Yeah. That, yeah. And we're trying to work on. We're trying to understand in uh, people that are seeking treatment. What do they think about it? Because there, there are different perspectives on this about among the users that if they um, know that it's laced with fentanyl, they will seek it out. And then there's some that will avoid, um, avoiding for obvious reasons, seeking it out because you get a better high, right? Or you, you get more bang for your buck. So um, there's places in, and one of my colleagues works in the Philadelphia area, and in Kensington, you can. Um, they track where there's an overdose death and then people are drawn to that area to buy from that person because that you can get better stuff, right? So it's just, you gotta think about it. Rational thinking goes out the window, right? So you gotta, you gotta think about it a little bit differently. <clears throat> so interprofessionally, so talking about, um, this isn't just between pharmacists and prescribers, um, but it was between prescribers with different specialties as well. So in the same way that um, we saw a lot of uh, distrust between primary care physicians and physicians working in pain management clinics, for example. And we've, we've had lots of situations where, especially in rural areas where rural primary care providers will um, refuse to treat pain and also refer, refuse to refer because they don't trust anyone to treat their pain appropriately which puts patients in kind of a weird situation. What are you supposed to do then for pain management there? Uh, Tylenol. So I don't know if you saw the JAMA article. Did you see it? Today, it's, it just came out today. It's in a VA population looking at um, uh, opioids for chronic pain versus non-opioid therapy, and there was no difference. There's a difference in side effect profile, but, but not in uh, function which is what you really ought to be looking at, not necessarily pain. What was a non-opioid therapy? It was a tiered. It was um, NSAIDs and acetaminophen first, yeah. and then some of the tricyclic antidepressants, amitriptyline, nortriptyline, uh, missing one. I'm forgetting one in there. And then the third tier, uh, tramadol was included in there because this was before tramadol was sure. controlled. Duloxetine, Lyrica, I believe was the tiered. But very few people even got to tramadol. Interesting. It was in a VA population. So um, check it out. It just came out, I think, today. It just came out. <clears throat> so this is an issue. Um, that there are some pharmacists that aren't going to trust some prescribers because of the, their perception of the quality of that prescribing. It's the same among prescribers. Role perceptions. Um, Pharmacists don't want to police, and they don't want to think that they, um, the prescribers perceive them as police. So that can change the way that they interact with you all. For example, um, if a prescriber or a pharmacist is a jerk, you don't, most people don't like to call jerks. So the chance of you calling someone that you've had a bad history with is pretty slim. 
this has been interesting. We, we've seen differences in this across the U.S., but in our population, physicians were very quick to point out that if you use this, you talk to a pharmacist less. So this kind of has replaced that interprofessional communication. We don't see that all over the U.S. Some are saying that this kind of facilitates communication. And then again, the indirect communication where we'll communicate through patients. I think something that's being overlooked here is this is probably communication in general. I kind of div divvy up into proactive and reactive. And I think this probably increases reactive. What's PMB? No. Prescription monitoring program. Sorry. CSMD here. CSMD. Yeah. Sorry. PMP, PDMP, EIEIO. We use all those different. Thanks. Okay, so here are your key tenets for a patient-centered communication. It requires a relationship and rapport. Um, we, we learned that in, in communication skills course. <clears throat> and then there's all this other care that involves time, oh. right? But if you wanna, if you wanna be patient-centered, these are things you probably ought to consider. And then I think there are some big deal decisions that we need to really get patient buy-in. And I think that most of those make sense as far as they are a pretty big deal. If you're starting someone on a medication they're going to be on for the rest of their life, it's a pretty big deal, right? Um, and opioids are a big deal, so they need to be on that list. So I wanted to give you just a, <coughs> I've got 30 minutes, is that right? Uh, no, I've got 15 minutes. All right. I'm going to go through my 12-step program. These are just 12 things you can do that um, I, I don't like it when somebody talks to me and doesn't give me something I can change. So I want to give you some things that you can change, and you're, you're welcome to the slides. <clears throat> and they're not just things that I think. They're things that they're evidence for. And um, <laughs> this is the first one. So, you know, this... this People wrestle with this over and over, and, um, and we've got to get this. Is addiction really a disease? Okay. Um, is an opioid use disorder a disease? Is it a, is it a brain disease? People that research this stuff, the, the jury is not out. It, it is considered a disease. So that's something that keep wrestling with it if you're not there yet and, and get to that point. Because if you're not to that point, the other 11 steps don't matter. Get smart about communication. Okay, ubiquity statements, what are those? Might know. So this is a communication approach to, to make something seem like you're not singling a patient out. So if you start out with your screening tool, which I'll show you in just a minute, that um, I'm going to ask you some questions that you may think are a little bit uncomfortable, but these are questions that we ask every patient that comes in the clinic. Okay, that's a ubiquity statement. So it doesn't, now, a patient may perceive it to single them out a little bit, but the more you know that everybody is getting this same statement, the more a patient's going to buy in. Okay. Summarizing, um, where you just go through and, um, and make sure that you understand and repeat the patient's, what the patient said back to the patient, right? Active listening, um, addressing feelings. These are all things from that course that um, a lot of um, the, um, college of medicine faculty are engaged in. And then you've got this, the whole motivational interviewing type stuff down here, right, where you kind of put this dissonance back in the patient's lap. Like, on one hand, you want this, but then your actions show me this. How do you work that out in your brain, right? And then you help them develop this discrepancy and make, hopefully, a positive behavior change their idea. Right? So there's all kinds of communication science that we don't get in pharmacy school, that you all don't get a good handle on in medical school. You mostly see this modeled. So my action item here would be when you're interacting with someone, think about is this an evidence-based communication strategy? And if you don't know, look it up or have somebody look it up. Okay. There's a lot of communication science here that can inform the way that you talk. Um, step three is to evaluate your default prescribing behaviors and change them if needed. 
So the default and the gut reactions are routinely flawed. Okay, we've um, I think I put a few more. Yeah, why do I prescribe the drugs that I do? Okay, I had a really interesting talk with dentists that shared an office building. One was a prosthodontist, one was a periodontist. They were performing very similar surgical procedures. And the amount of pain across them is going to be very, very similar. And these guys are buddies. They golf together. They, I mean, they, they see each other on a regular basis. And so I went to present to them in North Carolina, and we were talking about, okay, how, do you, how many controlled substances are you prescribing? And my buddy was like, dude, I'm prescribing at least five a day. And the other guy, the prosthodontist, was, I bet I haven't prescribed five in 10 years. And they'd never had this conversation. And what it came down to was when, he, um, when my periodontist friend was doing his fellowship, that was what was modeled. Everybody gets an opioid with these surgeries. The prosthodontist in his training never got them. And that 10 years later, they're doing what they were taught when they were trained. So um, you may need to have conversations amongst yourselves, right? But just run it through that filter of why am I doing what I do? Okay. A lot of this stuff can just be a default behavior if you don't take the time to think about it. Why do you prescribe the quantity that you do? Okay. A lot of times this could be for um, to keep a patient off your back, right? As opposed to, um, well, I think this is the minimum that they would need, right, for for this treatment. This is something else where are you are you prescribing for the worst case scenario or the best case scenario? And we found a lot among dentists that it's often for the worst case scenario as opposed to the best case scenario. So you prescribe for the longest amount of time that something could be painful. So things you could consider, okay? Um, limiting to three days if you're prescribing for an acute condition. Providing explicit, simple instructions, okay? So no, no more of the one to two, Q four to six. Just make it very simple. Pick one of those and go with it. Um, I'll talk about using the pharmacy to your advantage here when we get to the next uh, step here. And then prescribing for the best case versus worst. <clears throat> and then do a little bit of QI in your own practice. And I'd really encourage you to do this. Of try lower doses, try NSAIDs, try other things, and see wh what kind of results you get. Um, don't just take the literature um, and assume that that's going to apply to your patient population, but try it out and do a little bit of research on your own in your practice. Screen for risk and abuse. This is something that we need to be doing. This is a really easy tool. Have you seen the opioid risk tool before? ORT, it's, um, it's, again, it's not a perfect tool, but it's a way that you can score fairly quickly. Patients can do this on their own. You can have um, some of your clinic staff do this and ask patients these questions. So they're not hard. Some of them are uncomfortable, but again, it's where you're gonna have to use the ubiquity statements. But these are scored. You, you score them all, you add them all up, you score them, and this will kind of give you a risk profile for your patients, whether they've had a history or not, okay? okay. You're gonna capture if they have had a history This one is a, is a tool for current abuse, the assist. And I want to warn you about these, that the assist and your other tools for current abuse are not typically going to capture someone that's in recovery. Okay? So if someone has struggled in the past, but right now they're doing great, this is going to be during the past two weeks. Okay? So if they've struggled with an opioid, use disorder in the past, it's been a year, they're doing great, you could prescribe opioids to them again not knowing that they are in recovery if you don't have that conversation. So again, they're talking points, they're not decision-making tools. Questions about those? Those are just two. Those are the two of the shortest instruments you can use. Both are evidence-based, they've both been validated in these in patient populations. Patients can do them on their own if you really want them to. Okay. Really encourage you to, to work that in somehow.
All right, covered that. Something you might want to do is uh, spend a day with a quality addiction treatment provider. Um, there are quality providers, okay? I know they, they kind of get a bad rap sometimes around here, and some of them deservedly so. But if you want help finding a quality addiction treatment provider, let, like, reach out to me and I'll, I'll try to get you hooked up with one. Um, I, I really encourage you to visit Over Mountain if you haven't and use Over Mountain as a resource to refer to. Um, they're doing it right there. And, um, and that may not be the best for every patient, but they'll, they'll at least be able to let you know if it is uh, an appropriate treatment with methadone. So it won't always be. Get, get complete profiles from pharmacies. Um, I know it takes work, but um, again, to the best that you can, use, your, use these folks too, right? And also consider that when you screen, you will find positives. Okay, don't screen just for screening, but, and then, oh crap, now what? Right, because you're going to catch the car, and then you've got to be able to do something with them. <clears throat> so I'd, I'd highly recommend you seek out a BFF community pharmacist, um, one that you trust, one that you can call um, when Ryan's not around, or the other thing you can do and, and this is something that we used to do a lot in independent pharmacy when I worked in that setting, was that if, if you prescribe for a patient, say you prescribed a 30-day supply of a medication, but you just didn't feel that comfortable with it, use your pharmacist as a dispensing mechanism for shorter durations. We used to do this a lot with um, a couple guys in particular that we knew that whatever medicine you gave them was going in their mouth. Okay? It didn't matter if it was a week's worth. It didn't matter if it was 30 days worth. They had some mental health conditions and it was going to go in their mouth. So we had a couple guys that would come in every day to the pharmacy to get dispensed. They were 30-day prescriptions from the prescriber, but they were one-day dispensings. So don't think of it as 30-day prescribing equals 30-day dispensing. Use your pharmacist to your advantage to, to take advantage of that um, ability to do that. Okay. may not be something that you've thought about before. You need to know your addiction treatment resources. Okay, so um, medication-assisted treatment, has anybody taken the, the data waiver training? Okay. I took it. I mean, obviously, I can't get waivered. I'm, I'm not a, um, a physician. But I took, you can take the training whether you want the waiver or not. Okay. And you can do it, you can go to in-person four hours and then four, per, or four hours is on um, like an in-person study, or I'm sorry, like a study on your own. You can do a uh, four hour webinar live and then four hours on your own. It's not that big of a time commitment. And I did one, mine was Pacific time. So it was 9 p.m. to 1, a, it was horrible. <laughs> but I got it done. I just wanted to know like, if I'm gonna be hanging out with MAT prescribers, I want to know what kind of training they've had. So I would encourage you to do that. Um, and then if you want to get the data waiver, go for it, but uh, you'll at least have the training. So medication assisted treatment can be um, buprenorphine or Vivitrol, right? Or methadone. Those are the three approved. Opioid treatment programs routinely dispense methadone. They can dispense buprenorphine as well. Abstinence-based programs, um, the evidence isn't great for them, right? but for some people they work. You'll always find that for some people they work. But um, when you're comparing these, there's much more evidence for MAT as compared to abstinence-based. And then there's inpatient, um, intensive, outpatient. There's all kinds of different um, types of treatment, but I encourage you to have a good vocabulary about medication assisted treatment and if you need help with that please don't hesitate to ask. There's a great ASAM patient pocket guide that I think would be good for you to have. Um, we always have a hard time evaluating the quality of addiction treatment and the ASAM patient pocket guide does a really good job of saying this is what you should expect in a quality MAT provider so it's, it's a good thing to, to keep. 
And you talk about storage and disposal. If you don't have time to do it, call the pharmacy and tell them that you would really like for them to talk about storage and disposal with this patient. Okay? They'll, nine times out of ten, be really happy to do that. Okay, so um, that's a good reason to have a pharmacist BFF too. You can set expectations when opioids are prescribed. So if you prescribe and you think that the pain should last three days, and you can tell patients, I'm not telling you that they're going to listen, but it's a, great job, it's a good idea to set expectations of after three days, um, I expect you to throw the rest of them away appropriately. And maybe you give them one of these things. Have you seen these bags, the Tura bags? Um, these are bags that you, can, you could actually dispense or co-dispense with an opioid, and you just put a little bit of water in there, and it inactivates the medicine, and you just throw it in the trash. So you don't have to wait for a take-back event. You don't have to go to the law enforcement. You can just throw it away in your trash. So. How much do those cost? They're like four bucks a piece, but they're all over the place for, with coalitions, so you can get them for free. So. If we call Scripps in the pharmacy, can we just add that on and ask them to be dispensed with the medication? Yeah, once it gets to be the status quo, you can. I think some pharmacists are going to be like, I don't know what you're talking about. It's, they're pretty new. So they're not mm -hmm. stocked. Have you guys seen them in pharmacies now? Yeah. I don't, think they're, I don't think that they're there. They may have something on the, and this is going to be a tough sell too because some of the, the bigger chains are going to have things they want them to buy as opposed to being able to give this to them for free. But, for example, Mollenkrot has given out a ton of these for free. I see this as probably the way that pharma is going to support medication disposal in the future. All right, I've got to hurry. Use stories to connect. This is a big one. We've had examples of um, patients that kept medicine long enough from when they were, uh, when they delivered their child. Their child then uses the medication that's still in their medicine cabinet 15 to 18 years later. Okay, so stuff sticks around. Use stories to connect with your patients. You need to train your staff. It's not just about you, and if you buy into step one with the addiction and your staff don't, you can undo any good that you want to do. So your, your staff have to buy into this as well. And if you have top-notch communication skills and your staff don't, again, you've got to get everybody speaking the same language there. You know about the PDMP. Don't let it make decisions for you. Let it drive conversations with your patients. Okay? There's... Um, there's some evidence that this may actually lead to increased heroin use. Right? So there are unintended consequences of letting this drive your decisions because you'll just say no or not get somebody into treatment and just discharge and then heroin is going to go up. Encourage partial, fi partial fills of prescribed opioids. This is pretty new from the DEA. You can now partial fill C2s okay at the pharmacy there are some requirements at the pharmacy that may limit this but there will be some pharmacies that will be able to do this okay they have to be able to keep the same prescription number for example that can be a challenge with the software in community pharmacies but partial filling c2s is allowed integrate the science of safety you got to figure out some way to work that opioid risk tool into your workflow right so how do you do that with checklists how do you involve other people that are around you to be able to work some of this stuff in given limited time. It's not easy. And I can't say that I have the answer specific to your setting, but there are things you need to work on and things you need to consider from a science of safety checklist perspective. Yeah. I was just going to say we have the pain cast program here and we're making sure that everybody gets enrolled, enrolls their patients in it. So please, if you have someone on a CSA, talk to Tanya, um, get them enrolled in pain cast. There's an upgraded version that's coming very soon. And for the first years that know nothing about what I'm talking about, I'll be happy to explain it to you and we can show you too. So that has the, the soap and the calm and other screening tools and things like that. Awesome. So we, we've been using that for about three years here. Awesome. And it's being rolled out to the other two offices now. Okay. Good. Good deal. 
develop a CSI mechanism. So this is something that one of my fellows did, a control substance initiative. <clears throat> How can you use um, all of your brains to help you make better decisions and do that somehow in an organized manner? Okay, so if you have a complex patient, somehow have some mechanism, I'll volunteer Ryan, he can do it, where stuff gets funneled to him and you somehow use, um, use it as a teaching tool, okay, for a controlled substance, patients that, patients that may need controlled substances. Um, there are models for this, I can tell you more about that, I want to be respectful of your time and get you out of here. I think this is very true when it comes to controlled substances, MAT, anything that, that deals with opioids, we're kind of right there, right? And I always end with, this is probably the, one of the best quotes about communication. So I know that's really quick. I apologize for taking a little bit more time, but if you have any questions or want information, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, the purpose of the center for prescription drug abuse prevention and treatment is not to get a bunch of research dollars. The purpose is to be a resource for you all. It's, it's to be a resource for the community. Um, the Surgeon General is actually coming here tomorrow to learn more about what we're doing with opioids. And um, I think that says something, and I think that talks to the, the uniqueness of the center and what we're trying to do. So please use this as a resource. Questions? Awesome. Hey, thanks for coming. <laughs>